Hi guys, welcome to Trail Talk. I'm your host, Aaron Shimons. Thanks for joining our news and reaction show about the world of trail and ultra running. This week, we are joined with a new panelist. As we know, this is a US-American split, so we have one person out this week and another person in. This week, we're joined by Chrissy Palenz, joining us from Tahoe in California. We also have Matt Seidel, the newly signed Nord athlete, joining us for an interview to break down his epic full send run at the Black Canyon 100K last week. Matt is an exciting talent coming out of the US collegiate system. He jumped into the world of trail and ultra running a couple of years ago and has already racked up wins at the Lake Sonoma 50, Quicksilver 100K, and he ran a blistering 5.41 for fourth place at JFK 50. Also a reminder to check out our show sponsor, Goreware. Use the code IRUNOVERMOUNTAINS30 for an amazing 30% discount. That is global discount code. It's not UK, it's not Europe, it's America, it's Europe, it's wherever. Go to goreware.com and use the code. Tag us on Instagram. Let us know what you got. We'd love to see some of the gear. I'm really enjoying it. It's super stuff. We also have a discount code in the description below for Torque Nutrition, a British brand that makes, I think, the best gels in the business. Absolutely amazing stuff. So go and click on that link below. Get yourself a 10% discount. My favorite is the Apple Crumble and the Cherry Bakewell. You can also catch the show on Spotify. If you don't already know, just search Trail Talk. It'll come up, you'll find it. But you know what? We love having you here on YouTube, so stick with us here. Anyway, let's go and check in with our panel and talk all about Black Canyon 100K. All right, guys, uh, back for another show. This time, we're going to talk all about Black Canyon 100K. We have a new panelist uh, on the show. So, Chrissy, why don't you give us uh, the, the, the quick 20 seconds? Where are you? And um, tell us something interesting. I am in Tahoe in California and uh, I'm in the middle of schemo season so I'm uh, running on the roads and skiing uphill a lot it's kind of my life right now and shoveling snow I think whenever uh, I look on your Instagram it's probably like 90% snow sports and the rest is running it's definitely feeling like that these days I've been thinking about it a lot the past week and I'm like I actually really love skiing and I don't know why I do this running thing but then you know you get to summer and it all kind of figures itself out Cool. Well, uh, welcome to the show. Um, we're we're happy to we're happy to hear your your hot takes on uh, on Black Canyons. I'll kick things off. I thought Hayden Hawks kind of came back from injury, knocked it out of the park. But more impressively was the fact that he set a course record by sort of implementing sort of micro improvements. It wasn't that he was head and shoulders better than everybody else. It was he's gone away and over the past few years, he's worked on nutrition and worked on all these tiny little things. He had station transitions. He, he did a, a race simulation on, on the course, including uh, aid stations and things. So I thought that was really smart of him. Then also Rachel Drake, she's just having like an absolute burner of what feels like nearly a year now since her pregnancy and I think she's just going to have a super strong 2024. I thought that was really impressive and then maybe a couple other things. We've seen Heather Jackson have some uh, real adversity in that race. Um, I think that that's a new theme. Ricky, what did you think of the, the race and what were, what were your takeaways? Yeah, no, number one for me is Hayden Hawks. Like, unbelievable way to come back from a knee injury you know it's it's incredible it's it's uplifting to say the least you know i'm a big hayden hawks fan he's another one of the hoka men that i absolutely aspire to be like you know so i was delighted to see hayden come in with the win and again i think it's all down to specificity as well i know he's coming back from an injury but i think someone like hayden where he lives stuff like that he trains on, on on similar terrain to what the Black Canyons has to offer. I know there was snow and stuff like that at the start, but I mean, Hayden is so used to that kind of course, that kind of terrain, so he really showed what he can do. And like, that's his first race back. You know, I think he's only going to get better and better as this season goes on. Um, another big takeaway from it was uh, Hans Troyer. Hans Troyer for me was hands down the coolest thing about the race this year. It was like, this dude 
was going toe to toe with Hayden Hawks, kind of looking at him, going, I don't care. I don't give a fuck who Hayden Hawks is. I'm going to take him down. And he stayed with him up until the last 10 miles. And okay, yeah, you still have 10 miles to go. And he blew up. But I don't know, did he blow up or was his Achilles at him? Like, there was a big story about him where he missed a flight. He was jet lagged. He was this, that, the other. You know, he came in. I think he was in a boot up until about like, a week ago because of his Achilles. So, like, I think he really made the day. I was in and out all day because where I live, Ireland, the coverage, stuff like that, it's hard to follow it all day long. But, I mean, every time I came back in, I was expecting this guy to be dead and buried, and he was still there. He was still there all day. So, that that was just exciting for me to watch as an outsider looking in. So, what do you think, Troy? Man, all the things, right? All the things you all said, and then... um you know, just shout outs to, to, to Jupiter. Um, I'm, I was like kind of really upset that I didn't see a name. It's, you know, it's, it's Jupiter in, in, um, in Spanish, but in, you know, in English it's spelled Jupiter. And the fact that I didn't have a guy named Jupiter in my top three on fantasy is just like, what was I thinking? Right. And this guy just shows up and I think personally, besides Hayden had the, I mean, just a well executed event, a well executed race. And the whole day, you're just like, who is this guy? And then uh, my favorite part of the his interview is just kind of like, he's like low key, low key, like, well, I won everything in Mexico. So I figured I'd come to Black Cannon and show you and, and, and show everyone what I can do. And I'm just like, this guy, I am so excited to see, you know, what he can do at Western States, especially coming from where he trains. I think it's like the perfect place to get in the kind of training needed to show up to Western and, and really put a stamp on, on this year as far as his first year racing in American soil. And then um, touching on some of the ladies, like I, you know, Rachel Drake, like I, I love what she's doing. I love her story coming back from, um, from having her first kid and, and really getting specific as far as doing like uh, oh, specific from like a marathon training block. And then being like, I don't want to go run the trial qualified. I'm not going to run the trials. I'm running black Canyon. And then to kind of just, another well executed race and uh honestly uh, at her second 100k and and it just kind of shows like this lady is back and uh i am excited to to watch the green family run western states this year so chrissy uh any any thoughts yeah i mean i don't think i have to hit on any of the rest of the podium except i got a shout out to uh, chris myers because uh him and gus gibbs really really put it out there um and i am so stoked for him to hit states um He's he's got a good stock rising. Um, I think the other main storyline for me was kind of the obvious of how does everybody react when everything changes? You know, I mean, going mm. into race week, people started to realize, oh, shit, there's snow. Um, people got there and were like, all right, you know, throw the heat training out. We're going to just focus on everything else that we've worked on. You know, you saw a lot of ankles go down, especially in the women's field, and it was kind of devastating, but like that's, you know, you've got to prepare for everything you can possibly prepare for. And it's it's cool to see the race in a cool year and to see that the, you know, men's record only dropped by that much just shows how stout it is. And I, you know, I'd love to see the the women's keep pushing that direction too, of just getting really, really close. Yeah, it was it was a very different feel to a race uh, this year, and I was surprised the course record went down because, you know, Tom and Anthony were pushing each other last year, so that was the year to set set a course course record. So, yeah, that that was interesting. I don't think anybody saw that. Go back two, three, four weeks. Was anyone thinking there was going to be snow? snow on the ground and, and ice on the track for the start of that race. So that was definitely a, a curveball. One of these things we kind of have to get used to in this sport is just be ready to adapt and, and deal with whatever's in front of us. What did you guys think about the the commentary? And I can't sit in and and watch and watch a race for seven eight hours or whatever. I'll stick it on and listen to it. And then I wanted to, I I kind of rewatched it um this week because I just wanted to get a better take on on how it played out. And I love the stuff that Jamil and Mountain um Outpost do. But where why do we not have e bikes like the Golden Trail World Series? I can remember these conversations after last year's Black Canyon and maybe even the year before that, that this course has perfect cell service for so much of it and we're not going up and down mountains. Uh, so it's perfect for like an e-bike to, to follow along uh, in groups. 
So I'm just wondering why that isn't happening because you see the drone footage, which is which is great when it's great, but it feels like 80% of the time it's either the operator like trying to frame the shot and it's also pixelated. So I don't know, I think it's not improved as much as I was hoping in 12 months. And that's not any shade on, on Jamil and the crew who do a great job and the commentary and interviews and the, the preview shows and the input from uh, Free Trail and the guys at Single Track being there. That, that all adds to it. But what has the actual race coverage improved on? Chrissy, do you want to take this one? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have different access issues for e-bikes in the States. And so every trail system and park system has different rules. So I don't know if they're like having that issue or not. You know, I know here we often have like a pilot program and then it's kind of like hit or miss on whether they actually like having e-bikes on the trails sharing access. So from that standpoint, it would be awesome to have. And it's definitely improving with the drone coverage. Um, I think from a U.S standpoint as well you know i think i'm just used to seeing fuzzy video in u.s races and so when i was able to tune in um i was actually kind of surprised that it was better than last year and the year before i think for me it was a step up but then yeah you compare to european races in asia and we're just not coming close still i think the, the main thing that i would like to see coming up this year is the sort of post-race recaps that we see from the Golden Trail World Series. Can you imagine the hype that would create if that was, uh, if we had something like that from Black Canyon or, or, or last year's race or, or anything? That would be so cool, just like five, six, seven minutes or whatever, bundle some of the, the high quality footage together. I was having to scroll through nine hours of a, a YouTube live feed to try and find the good bits. And whenever you're scrubbing over nine hours, it's really easy to miss those key moments. So yeah, it left me wanting more. Ricky, what did you think of that? It reminds me of my van, of my van in the west of Ireland. In the west of Ireland, you cannot pick up the radio the same way you can in the rest of the country. And when I drive around the west in my van, it's like this, and it is head wrecking. And I know it's hard. I know it's very hard to get good footage out in these things. And you're expecting people to follow something for like 100 kilometers, you know, that's taken like 8, 9, 10 hours. But it needs to be better for the sport to grow and for people to want to watch it for 7 or 8 hours. It's got to be good. Like It's got to be like marathon coverage where you can just sit there and watch it and, and not be going, Jesus Christ, trying to get cell service or trying to get coverage or trying to get something, you know, so... Definitely, definitely needs to be worked on on that. And like you said, would say the YouTube content, what I went through today was, I went, uh, Hans Troyer had a, a YouTube video up himself. It was his, I think it was his mom and his girlfriend, or maybe his mom and his sister, I'm not sure. And they were showing, so I was getting footage of the race from, from two random people, rather than like Black Canyons itself or something like that. So yeah, definitely, definitely could be better, you know, room for improvement, but still, still a super exciting race and it's it's a race that i like want to race so like it it, it hasn't put me off you know super excited and and let's just uh point out that ricky's talking about analog radio <laughs> never mind we're not talking about 4g we're not talking about 5g we're not even talking about digital radio we're talking about proper hillbilly analog radio fm radio right <laughs> correct <laughs> in the sticks ricky that's 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 where you are troy what do you think of the production and the and that type of stuff the, the yeah. drones yeah so you know i think the drone shots it's they definitely were a little bit on the on the grainy side on some points and the hard part i have is you know there are people in the chat trying to compare what mountain outpost is doing with their resources to utmb and what utmb does with their resources and it's like you're trying to it's it's not even a, a worthy comparison because uh, while UTMB is definitely not like this huge, it's grown into this huge thing, but they have like ridiculous sponsorship dollars coming into the tune of like, you know, six, seven, excuse me, seven figures just to do the media. So like when you have those kind of resources, you can put on a production that is, it's markedly better. And when you look at like what Jamil has done um, from the Mountain Outpost standpoint, like they're just 
similar to what UTMB did back in the in the early aughts and in the early teens is like they're just putting the resources back into it and slowly growing it and slowly scaling it. And the technology to do this isn't it's not cheap by any means to just kind of throw down um, a bunch of Starlinks, have the right cameras, have all the right drones show up. Most of it is like volunteers coming in to to help and support. And so I think you know what you see with Black Canyon is like a patchwork of technology that they're assembling together to create something um, that's really special and. I do agree. Like it, it needs to get better, and and I know that's you know it's it's something that I, I know that they're definitely focused on. I I did like seeing the hire of of Zach Marion to come on and kind of direct some of these live streams, so you can see that like uh, Matt and Jamil are pulling some of the weight off of their shoulders, putting it on other people's shoulders, and allowing uh, the ability for their for their team and their organization to 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 scale what they're doing um, with Mount Outpost. So, you know, to be determined. I mean, as someone that has a film and video a degree in film and video production like i know what it looks like on the back end to try to make these things work and so i have a little bit more empathy than like your common people in the chat that are probably tuning into their first youtube live stream and they're just like wtf is this it, this needs to be better it's 2023 and my comment is always like create a solution what do they need what is it that you can do to help them make it better as opposed to just complaining about the fact that you don't like that there's some pixels on the screen so i close the chat in those live streams now it used to be a year or two ago that it was just like the people in the ultra running community that you knew from instagram or whatever there was in the chat yo what's up but now there's like <laughs> there's a bit of trolling going on so i i i just say yo and then hide the chat and then, and just have it on in the background i do like the addition of zach marion and skylar hall I think the MVP is Leah on the commentary. I think she's brilliant. I think the first time that she got the mic out on the course was back at Bandera 2022. She's natural. She has all of the knowledge. The the runners know her. And I think she is, uh, she's very good at that. Chrissy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, that was my other thought was just you know, getting getting the commentators out on course, you know, Zach's done it as well, makes a huge difference to me in being engaged, knowing what's going on, um, especially when, you know, you've got a life and you're just popping in and out of the YouTube. It, it makes a huge difference. And I love that they're pulling a team together from, you know, what essentially are different trail running media groups. Um, there's no, there's no like issue with competition. Everybody is trying to bring the sport up, trying to bring commentating and live coverage up. And that's, that's I think, the best way we're going to grow the sport and the coverage of the sport. Yeah, I I, I love the fact that um, Dylan and Ryan and, and Free Trail and stuff are going to these races now and doing their own their own media piece around it. And it's more like last year, if they did that, uh, it felt like they were going and making an, like a YouTube video or something, whereas now they're doing these pre and post shows and doing interviews and, and working it out so they're not clashing with certain streams and stuff. So I think that's everyone kind of just going, yeah, this, we're all in this together. Let's just build some of this hype around it, which is pretty cool. The other thing then is... This is this, this was a, the second round of the World Trail Majors. That brought some more attention to it. We're getting some of the, the WTM sort of um, social media. I think the jury's still out on, on the WTM. Uh, maybe this is a good opportunity for us just to know, Chrissy, are you UTMB or WTM or both? I'm, I'm, I'm all in on um, WTM or just anything that's promoting local races and bringing this sport up in a healthy way. I'm excited to see what they can do. I think it's going to take a while for them to to kind of get their shit together and to get the resources that they need. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential in in race directors learning from each other and promoting each other. We will uh, we will dive into that and maybe get you somewhat off the fence uh, on a on a future show. We 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 need some spicy hot takes on the hashtag fuck UTMB here. Um, that's what people are. <laughs> that's what people want to know. Oh, pe oh, people so, know those takes of mine. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of uh, prize money at Black Canyon, there's no prize money there. And it's something that kind of doesn't sit right. One of the arguments for prize money in this or no prize money in the sport is, you know, that it'll ruin it and all this type of stuff. But then we also have the other commentary lines around, well, people are trying to make a living off of this, trying to professionalize the sport. That's what 
the, every all of these issues that we're kind of dealing with in the past few years are growing pains, and the sooner we jump to uh, athletes earning a livable wage in line with other sports and able to earn prize money at prestigious events, which you would say Black Canyon is the you know uh, top level event um, globally uh, for that distance, it just it doesn't make sense to me that there's no prize money. Just for the viewer's knowledge, the only thing that the winners will get of the top three is their entry into Western States. They'll get that paid. It was about 400 odd dollars. Hayden would have got that paid by Hoka anyway, and his travel and things. So I'm not sure. Uh, did they just give him 500 quid then? Uh, cash or is it not transferable we stuck a poll up on the instagram broadcast channel so basically i asked the question do you care if if first second and third get prize money and i was actually surprised that like we had 46 votes for yes but we had 22 for no which sort of surprised me way closer than what i thought it would be ricky what was your vote and what is your take my vote i kind of looked at that like what do I think of prize money in general, not just not Black Canyons, right? As in in general, because like I've done so many races here in Ireland and other places that I've won them and there's been no prize money. And I've never really cared because there's like, let's say a prestige to win in a race that's well known. And like some people just, you know, if there was, I, I've seen other races that have prize money and they're not as well known. And it, like you win that race, you win some money, but you don't get that prestige for winning it. Like nobody gives a shit about it. Like, but for something like Black Canyons, there has to be prize money. There, there just has to be prize money in that race. That is the most elite race of the year so far. Like, right. That, that had like, I don't know, maybe 40 runners in that that were running absolutely out of their skin to win that race or to get a golden ticket. Like, they are the most professional professional athletes you're going to find. The least you can do is have prize money for, you know, first, second and third in a race like that that is so stacked. Like, a race like that is what we are talking about right now. So we're super excited about watching a race like that. So the least they could do is have prize money for those people, you know. Before we hear Troy's take, don't discount the fact that you won that race uh, some years ago and you're presented with an orange mud hydration pack. That does not count for nothing. <laughs> Prestige. <laughs> Troy, what do you, what do you think about this whole prize money thing? Are you a yes or are you a no? Yeah, so I'm a yes. Um, when it comes to you know tip of the call it tip of the spear races, you know like uh, races that that have prestige, races that are supposed to be part of a series, um, I think there definitely should be prize money. It's it's kind of tough. This goes back to the lack of endemic sponsorship, uh, and I think that's where like World Trade Trail Majors really needs one because you need someone that can help with these race directors and these organizations like pony up the prize money. Um, because it goes back to like what I mentioned in, in the in the previous section session about you know how do you scale a live stream with a grassroots organization? It's like they're they're investing all the money back into it. So at the end of the day, it's like, well, what do you want? Do we want does, does the audience itself want a better live stream or do we want prize money? Because it's going to be in this situation, at least with Aravipa, I know it's a it's either or. It's not an either or. It's a this or that situation, and so. How do you create these price purses? What is um, World Trade Ma World Trail Majors going to do in order to ensure that there is like an adequate price purse uh, at all of the events that are like encompassed within it? And and you know, for me, it just comes back to like who is the title sponsor for the entire event, and what are they doing to add value to the series that's being created? For me, it's like it's tough with Black Canyon. I want to see a better live stream as a consumer, but I also really care that the that the runners have something. You know, that's five hundred dollars paid for your western states entry it's great for someone that's an unsponsored runner it's great for someone that doesn't have that as a bonus structure in their contract you know and it's amazing that black canyon is willing to do it as a grass is a, is a really for lack of a better word like still a grassroots family owned and operated organization uh, but at the end of the day there needs to be more for the runners yeah it is a family business but it's probably the biggest trail running events company in the states sure i don't think we can claim that that is a valid a valid reason i think the top three there should be maybe like a three two one thousand split for the podium um and that's not no shade on aravipa who simply probably do it better than than anybody else anyway but surely like when they had this discussion about adding this to the world trail majors 
they, they should have talked about this and they should have said, look, we're going to come in, we're going to create this new, this fucking new super race to take on UTMB. Let's have a talk about it. Let's do what's best for the race. Let's do what's best for the athlete. Like surely they had that conversation and, and somebody had bound to have said, we need prize money at this. You know, I, I don't understand how there's not prize money at a race like that. My understanding is that it's part of their goal is to come up with prize money and to have that be part of why they're doing this. I think it's just they haven't had the time to pull the resources together. Um, and my, my hope is that that will for sure change. Um, and honestly, I'd like to see it even go 10 deep because I don't think we see any other North American race or North American field that, that goes as deep as this one does. Black Canyon seems to have picked up the mantle this year. Uh, and finally, we found uh, a replacement for the TNF50. The buzz, the hype. This is the race that people want to do at this time of year. Uh, and I look forward to seeing where it goes uh, next year. I want to say one thing. I know that Aravipe is hiring a director of partnerships. And so maybe that's uh, probably one of the number one roles of, of, of that new position is like <laughs> figure out how to bring in more money uh, so we can pay the athletes more for the races that we're doing. So, uh, you know, pound sign just saying. Did you put that as a footnote in your CV? Uh, I did. Yeah, I totally. I, I definitely, I mean, uh, full disclosure, I definitely submitted my resume. So, you know, if anyone at Air Vipe is listening and, and, and they want someone to, to come in and help them with that, you know, my, my hand's up. So there's a, there's a good reason enough to kick you out of Trail Talk because, you know, any spice that was there will be gone. <laughs> There'll be no hot takes coming from Troy at all. I was only, the only thing I want to say, it's way more interesting than what you just said, Troy. I wanted to know how far out with your guesses because I was way out on the women. I got two right on the men. I got Hayden Hawks and Chris Myers on the men. Guys, I was so bad in, in fantasy. I got to give a shout out to uh, to Wolfie because he, he's, he's top of the, the Trail Talk League right now with uh, oh. Travis Longcar, Insider Trading in second and Aid Station Fireball in third. Insider and, Trading. Uh, here, who's in fourth and fifth? Uh, Troy and Chrissy. So nice, nice one. I'm eighth. I didn't even, I haven't even looked, Aaron, because I was like, I had to have done terribly based on just looking at the results and trying to remember what I put up. I was like, my whole fantasy is expl has just blown up. So I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to look. And so now I need to go so I can get, you know, feel all warm and fuzzy about actually getting close to beating those guys. So that is the beauty of having the Trail Talk League. You can just compete in the league with your, the small, less competitive. Uh, group of people. Hats off to to uh, you guys um, for for doing well. And Ricky, yeah, you were shite. <laughs> shite, fucking shite. <laughs> I, I had, but I had like Stephen Kirsch in there. I had him at fifth. So like, I think I was on the money with that. Was Stephen Kirsch fifth? I think he was. I know it doesn't matter, like, but I mean, I thought that was a good guess, and then. Pro Tim Tallis and I had him at tenth and he was eleventh. I think we've 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 uh, talked enough. We're half an hour in here. Let's jump into our interview with Matt Seidel. Over to the interview. Matt Seidel, welcome to Trail Talk. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining from a parking lot in a ski resort. Is that right? Where are you? Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I am at a Snowbird Ski Resort here in Utah. I love to uh, take some time after races to like reset and try some other things. So I love going on like week long ski trips in the winter time after racing. It's a. I saw on your Instagram uh, a friend or or you or somebody was on a, a snowboard um, coming down off piste somewhere. So uh, it looks like you've got some some good powder. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's. Uh... We kind of avoided California has been where I live in the West Coast has had some mediocre snow this year, but Utah's uh, here in the mountains and the Rockies is nice and good. All right. So why don't you just start off and give us like 60 seconds on who is Matt Seidel. Let us know where you live, what age you are, when you got into running. Just give us the, the, the quick blast. Perfect. 60 seconds. We can do it. So yeah, I am Matt Seidel. I am based out of uh, Oakland, California, here in the United States. Well, I am not here currently, but uh, yeah, been in love with running since I was about 13 years old. I actually ran um, cross country and track and field throughout both high school and university. Um, went up, was up in Seattle here in the U.S. Uh, for college and, you know, ran all the short distances from like a mile to 10K. And then the second I finished uh, university was kind of 
uh, wanted a reset, but still had this deep love of running and took a couple of years in the pandemic to really get me into trail ultra running and just this deep love of being immersed in the mountains. So I've been running uh, ultra marathons really longest distance I've done so far is a hundred kilometers, uh, for about two, two and a half years and really just discovering more and more each time and falling deeper, deeper in love with it. Um, yeah, I like to think I have a lot of hobbies outside of running and I do. So, so trying to keep a nice balanced lifestyle helps me, um, really give my best to running and everything else. And yeah, always have something fun to do. How did you go from like the track and field and, and road and super fast, um, flat stuff into trail like what was the thing that sparked the interest yeah it ironically almost had nothing to do with running that really got me into it i um yes and i actually went to graduate school after finishing my undergrad university and took about a year and a half off of any form of competitive training or running just doing it for fun and then coming back uh, starting to really get into running. I also was really into like uh, backpacking and like spending two, three, four days out in the Sierra Nevada mountains and just getting deeply immersed. And then I would see these people running and all the things that would take me three days to do, people would do in like an afternoon. Like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. Um, and so I think a combination of uh, combining different hobbies with just kind of finding the right people around you. I think I just had a few friends in the Bay. I mean, the Bay Area here in California is just a vibrant, rich culture with so many people who love all things trail and ultra running. So you, you meet a couple people, they convince you to do some stupid things. And next thing you know, you're signing up for uh, what eight ultra marathons in a single year. So it's a, it's a slippery slope. But yeah, I think that just constant immersion in nature and being out on dirt is just something that is unparalleled to me yeah that's that's interesting and how many years ago was that that you were into like the the backpacking type stuff yeah it was probably about two three it was really in 2020 and kind of the heart of the covid pandemic where a lot of the other hobbies that i do usually involve going out and about in you know san francisco and other big cities just couldn't do them so the kind of only hobbies i had were um just being in the middle of nowhere and kind of spending it with a couple friends and i think it's definitely a heavy departure from the running i was used to i think uh, one thing I really was appreciative of is when I did high school track and field and cross country specifically, our coach was very keen to get us out on trails as many days of the week as we could. So even though the workouts and the races were all, you know, on tracks and really fast, we still tried our best to kind of get out to different regional parks around where we lived and really get that uh, experience of trail running because as pretty much any close friend, even those who have nothing to do with trail ultra running will tell you like trail running is just so much more of an enjoyable experience than spending time on pavement, at least in the crowds I'm in. Uh, I do love fast pavement running sometimes too, but. Um, yeah, and are you still addicted to the miles or have you transitioned to training by time? Oh, I am still a distance uh, based trainer. It's just, it's easier for me to map out routes. Uh, I was actually talking to a friend a couple of days ago and he was pointing out based on just like my little Strava profile, I was like, you still do a good job of running about the same time every week. So um, I think it's, it's different ways to describe the same thing, but I, I love running by distance. It's just as a, someone who is uh, outside of running a professional uh, engineer, like it's just very easy to conceive the numbers and kind of a, a set amount of time. I looked at your your Strava profile and it's a it's a beautiful curve like that uh, that uh, line uh, and I think it was up around I'm viewing it in kilometers but I think it was like 140 100 and around it's... there I think sometimes we can get uh, stuck on like not letting that curve dip down and you know it's uh, but yours is pretty consistent and you're getting in some some good good work what percentage of of those miles are even on the road? Yeah, good question. And I, I would say it highly depends on the race I'm training for. I think one thing I'm really excited about this year, um, especially being my first year as a sponsored athlete, I recently signed with uh, the shoe company Norda uh, within the last four or five months. But uh, I try to cater my training based on what race I have coming up. And I am fortunate enough to really like a different, a lot of different races. So before Black Canyon, the last race I did was actually a road marathon. So when I'm training for road marathons, I try to do a lot of fast, flat miles. Um, I still, my easy recovery runs, I still try to do on trails. Just that's what really gets me going and gets me moving in the morning. But I'd say if I have my way um, and travel aside, like, Ideally, 80 to 90% of my running is on trails, and I'm fortunate enough that where I live has about 
seven or eight different regional parks within a 10 minute drive of my house. So I have, I have the access. So I think when it's there and I'm committed to it, it's kind of like, why not go for it? So, um, I try to run on trails as much as possible, but you know, I still don't mind a nice, fast, uh, pavement run. Yeah, cool. Uh, and then just touching then on, on CIM, you ran, uh, 223 in December, uh, how close to target was that? Yes, so it was actually a 225, um, oh, which 225, was about sorry. A, so yes, uh, CIM uh, was it was off of my target, the uh, target for that race. And I've since I've started kind of competitive distance, like ultra endurance running, um, I still try to do about one road marathon a year. I think it's a nice way to just reset the mind, really work on the the speed it's it's funny for me with someone who grew up running 3k's 5k's 10k's to think of a marathon as a speed race but really relative to a lot of the races i'm trying to get into now it feels like it so um, the ultimate goal for that was to try to run the united states olympic marathon trial standard which is for men this cycle a 218 so that um, was definitely a very ambitious goal for me it would have been about a seven minute pr but i knew that the when i ran my pr in the marathon i knew next to nothing about strategy so and i was in nowhere near as good a shape as i felt this time around so went out strong and was actually on pace exactly where i wanted to be halfway through the race at about 68 30 for the first half marathon and then um the pace just started to wear at me and started to fade in the back half but um i think my racing style for that race and really for every race I go into, you kind of have to have a defined goal in mind. And it's like, all right, this is the one goal I have. So even if it blows up in my face, um, I'm going to do what I can to achieve that peak goal and kind of whatever happens after that happens. So it was like, all right, we could run conservatively and, you know, run a nice solid PR, but miss that lofty goal. Or we could shoot for that lofty goal and see what happens. And I think that's very much, at least at this moment in time, the kind of style of racing I like to do. So put our nose in it and it didn't go perfectly, but... Uh, I still had a good time and still above all else felt like I had a really good kind of um, three month training block for that race. That's going to set me up for a lot of success in this coming year. So it's, it's been a, a thing for as long as I can remember. Uh, I've been running ultras for about 10 years and December through March uh, road marathon, you know, we uh, sadistically think is as speed work. And I still maintain yeah. that a road marathon run properly is May, might be the hardest thing you ever do. Uh, it's oh, it's yeah. a different <laughs> it's a different type of pain. Um, it is. So and it's it's like that first thirty k twenty miles. Uh, the pace is fine, and then uh, you know you you very you very quickly find out uh, is there a cliff here, and <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, yeah. that's when the wheels come off. So it, was it around the twenty mile mark that you 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 figured that you weren't going to hit the two eighteen or? or had you started to readjust goals before that? Probably it was a kind of cascading effect. I'd say at half marathon, I was on pace, but I was like, okay, this doesn't feel super duper comfortable, as comfortable as I'd like it to. And yeah, I know from experience, the best marathon I ran was actually CIM in 2021. Um, but I made it about 19, 20 miles before things felt bad. This race at about mile 14, it started to slow down a little. And then at mile 17, it really... Um, started to really back off pace wise which ironically was better than the last road marathon i had tried to do i did chicago in 2022 and it took all of nine miles for me to realize the pace i was running was unsustainable granted i was in far inferior shape than i feel now so it it made sense to me so it's um it's a learning process every time you're on a marathon it's uh how do you achieve this goal and i think having that very lofty goal of like the oh, Olympic trials standard would be really fun. I think if I removed that weight, I probably could have run a, a good five, six minutes faster. But, you know, once you cross over that line, it's whew, you come flying back. So there's only so many matches to burn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Moving into the, the trail world, of course, you ran, let's hope I get this time right, 1223 <laughs> at CCC. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. <laughs> Got it right. <laughs> did, my, did my homework. Uh, and that's actually wh where we met um, through yes. oh, yeah. a mutual friend, uh, Chrissy. I think it was at the Like the Wind party in, in oh, Chamonix. Yeah. Do you have plans to go back to UTMB Mont Blanc this August? Currently, yes. I am actually signed up for CCC again this year. I um, was kind of, I feel like there was a lot of um, 
a lot of things I could improve upon. I think last year was my first time running that distance and honestly was a, a foreign concept to me as a race. The longest race I had ever done to that point was about nine hours in length. So uh, I learned a lot of things kind of, it was literally my first time visiting Europe. So um, really just kind of an immersion of all senses. So I think having a chance to come back, do it again, see a lot of uh, familiar faces, have some, have a good feeling of the course. Um, it could be uh a good chance to really nail it out of the park. And I'm very happy with how I performed last year, but I also have extremely lofty goals for myself. So I know that if I run things smart and intelligently, um, the kind of world is my oyster. And I think there's a lot of room to shave off even an hour plus, if not more this year. It was a good debut at the, at the CCC, but I think you're right. There's so much to be gained just from having experience there. And the fact that it was your first time racing in Europe, everyone arrives in Chamonix and in the Alps and, you know, they're like, oh shit, this is steeper than what I was expecting. And then, you know, just it's people say, oh, the, the Tour de Mont Blanc isn't technical. Yeah, it's kind of technical in places, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's going to hurt if you fall, it's steep. So yeah, you've got those, those different types of aid stations to get used to. Uh, did you have support during the race? Yes, actually, our same mutual friend, Chrissy, was actually my crew for the entire uh, race. She had run uh, OCC the day before um, and then came out. And so I yeah, had full support. And I think this time around, now knowing the things I know, um, like I know like a few different nutritional choices to make. And um, honestly, above all else, um, just kind of getting used to the aid stations and kind of the different types of food. And um, I think not knowing when to push and when not to push is probably the biggest insight. I think you, you get those massive steep 4,000 foot climbs right off the gate. You're like, ah, I should go out too conservative or, oh, I should push too hard. It's like, no, you got to find that right line. I think if you can, if you know when to push and uh, kind of when to actually call someone's move when they're going, um, can really set you up for success. Um, I look forward to seeing how, how you do there oh. and, and I'll, I'll see you in Chamonix in August for sure. Moving on to Norda. Uh, we talk about Norda a lot in this show. We talk oh, yeah. about shoes a lot in this show. <laughs> you know, we're, oh, we all no. seem to be gear, gearheads in, in, the tra- in the trail world. Uh, how did the Norda sponsorship come around? Yeah, it was kind of a perfect um, little storm of events that happened. Um, so I'd been yeah competitively putting myself out there in trail ultra running for probably about two years time, was unsponsored and kind of very much, I think, the goal of a lot of similar friends who are in situations was to get sponsored. But, you know, you kind of got to find the right fit and got to make sense. The athletes got to pair. And it was honestly a... The first time I met Norda was actually in my hometown of Oakland. They were doing a tour for the release of the 002s. Um, we have a really cool running store in Oakland called Renegade um, that's right in downtown that I visit frequently, try to you know buy different products from. And I saw they were doing a collab with Norda, and I'd heard from a lot of my friends and my running crew, the uh, Bay Bandits. A lot of friends were just couldn't say a bad thing about Norda. They were just obsessing over it. They loved it. And I was like, oh, I love it. And the, the thing that held me back was, you know, they are pricier shoes. So I was, as someone trying to like save as much money as I could, I was like, okay, maybe I'll check them out if I have an opportunity. And they did this race at uh, Redwood Regional Park, which is actually about six minute drive from my house. I was like, oh, perfect. And it was, hey, we'll do like a two mile race and the winner gets a free pair of Nordas. I'm like, oh, easy like this is my home trails i know what i'm doing and i fancy myself to be a decent runner so i showed up ran the race i think i won by like a minute and then yeah nick and willow were waiting at the top and they're like oh hey blah, blah, blah. like we're doing a little after party at the store come and hang out with us and um so i went down afterwards we started talking and within you know five minutes of meeting them um they said what are your next what's your next race and are you sponsored and then i said i'm doing ccc this is about a month before ccc last year and they're like oh we will be there blah 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 you know utmb is our big push and also good to know you're not sponsored i'm like oh okay not gonna really overthink that one too much they gave me a couple of free pairs of shoes and then we met in chamonix um had some nice conversations i hung out with a lot of the northern athletes at the house they were um working at and then uh, next thing you know kind of right after um, CCC went and had coffee with them and they said, we kind of really like you. We think it's a good fit. Would you like to join our team? And it was kind of a no brainer to me because I'd really grown to like the shoes I was wearing. More importantly, I really liked the people involved. And I think when you have that perfect combination of like athlete and 
support that kind of are looking for the same things. Um, I think uh, obviously no, no, by no means a like Hoka or Nike that have, you know, millions of dollars or what budgets are for trail running, but they definitely don't have eons of resources, but it felt like a really good fit for me. Like I absolutely love the shoes. I love the people and the amount of support they can provide is kind of perfect for my stage in my career in life. So yeah, everything aligned. Yeah couldn't be happier to be with them they're definitely a company i feel really strongly about which shoe do you wear more the 001 or the 002 definitely a big 001 fan i think a little bit more of a cushion shoe i have uh, strangely enough come to really like the 02s recently i love but it's like a a and an a plus there's really no they're both phenomenal shoes and actually if i had to pick a favorite it might be the 003s even though they're not a running shoe i'm currently wearing them right now and they're just the comfiest things i've ever worn and um they have i, I joke that they have yet to release especially all their different colorways they've yet to release something i didn't love so it's like oh I'll, I'll say a bad thing when they come out with something bad but they've yet to do it so yeah the, the, the color palettes have been on have been on point uh I, I'm wearing the, the O3 right now as well, so um, jinx. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, have you run in the in the three? I, I I I've never run in them. I have not, and I've talked to a lot of people about this because they see me wearing them. Like, oh, are those running shoes? And I'm like, no, but they could be. I think my my stance is I, I I won't run in them. I would feel totally comfortable running it. I think I've done a lot some hiking with them. Uh, you know, they, I think they're a big recovery shoe. But uh, I think having the privilege of being one of their athletes, like I have access to all the you know O ones and O twos I have, so I would definitely run in those over the O threes. But I think these would, if push came to shove, and I had one pair of shoes, and it happened to be these, I could go for a few, like a half hour run, and feel totally comfortable in them. I'm interested to see what uh, type of colorways that they they, um, they come out with on the 003. I think that will be pretty interesting. Oh yeah, they, so, uh, I've 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 seen a little insider intel, and there's some there's some cool ones coming out. And I think the the coolest one is they're going to have a color. I think I can say this, but they have a color wave that's like all three shoes have the same color wave to like really highlight all of their collection. And moving on, then what was your Norda shoe for the Black Canyon, the 001? Yes, so I uh, ran in multiple pairs. I switched shoes at the final Crucible Aid Station. I went with oh ones the whole way though, so it was really shoe change. Actually, the only two races I've ever done a shoe change were CCC and Black Canyon. Um, I'd say the only minor drawback to Nordic shoes, and I really any trail shoe I've found is when you get them deeply submerged in water and your feet start sliding around. The like only way to really heal that is to switch out shoes. So the I went from, yeah, one pair of O1s to the other, and, um, yeah, they fit like a glove, feel really comfortable. Um, yeah, I'd run infinite miles in a pair of O1s. They just feel great the whole time. Yeah, the, the, they're one shoe that is a very consistent ride. You know, very often a, a shoe in an ultra starts to flatten out, and you experience that flat, flattening out after so many hours, whereas the O1 just doesn't do that. I, I think I wore it for... 90k of the uh, or 80k of the uh, Swiss Alps 100 last year mm. and it was it was great it was like a pleasure to put on I put it on oh, yeah. uh, halfway through the race and uh, it was like ah oh, so soft why didn't it start in this in this shoe <laughs> <laughs> okay. um so let's let's break down some of the some of Black Canyon last year you ran it a little bit quicker you placed tenth I believe this year you went full send from the gun and you finished a little bit slower in 19th place but the whole field was 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 faster as well so let's start off with the full send where where did that come from were you, were you just reading the situation or, or give us the give us your thoughts on the first sort of um 30 40k oh happily um so yeah i come in Come into every race with a solid plan, but one that's never set in stone, one that's always mendable. And coming into the race, I knew, uh, and yeah, from experience having run Black Canyon the previous year, I knew every step of the course, I knew what was coming. And for me, the A, the explicit goal coming in was, well, I really want a gold ticket. Like, I'm going to do whatever makes the most sense to try to get into that position. And the kind of mantras or kind of strategies I had thought through um, was really trying to be 
the one really overlying theme was like be specific like know the parts of the course where you are suited to run and run those intelligently to the best of your ability um and for me i knew that uh the first 20 miles of the race really until that first major crew blade station is gradual downhill the nicest trails you experience and so i knew that it's kind of ride that knife's edge delicately like don't burn yourself too hard um but the the first third of the course really suits me so it's like i'm going to run the strongest part of the course to the best of my abilities and then kind of reassess where we're at um so i didn't going out in the lead wasn't necessarily the plan it wasn't not the plan either i think the goal was to just run it intelligently smartly um and with the pack and then i'd say at about mile seven coming up to the first aid station we hit um the entire pack just kind of felt like it started to ease up and we were still in a pack of about 20 people and i knew that the it was after that was going to be a long gradual downhill to the next aid station and it's very runnable trail it's a little technical if you're in a pack so i i really didn't want to be bunched up with a bunch of people and no one else really seemed like they wanted to make a move so i just kind of didn't even feel like I pushed too hard, but just made the move, went to the front, and then we just hit a long downhill, and I said, well, I've trained on downhills a lot. I know what this effort should feel like, so I'm going to run an effort I feel comfortable running, um, and that's really led to the next 10 miles of being out in front and stringing out the pack. Um, I never doubted being there. It never uh, was kind of so that I felt wary about, and um, yeah, so I just kind of running with confidence, running with strength, knowing what parts of the course suited me well, just kind of got in the moment i don't think the moment was too big but it just kind of felt right to take the lead and kind of not let the pace sit back and relax for too long and i knew that uh by no means was the goal to drop the field that was not the goal it was to kind of keep it an honest effort the whole way and uh, i still feel confident in making that decision now and do you run uh or race or train by rpa or heart rate or what's your sort of barometer for intensity Yes, I check heart rate data after every run, but it's not something I um, run by in the moment. Uh, honest, for lack of a better scientific term, I try to do a lot of running by feel. I just having run for 10, gosh, what now, over 13 years, I've, I've learned what pace zones feel like and kind of qualitatively how I'm assessing. So in the moment, it's definitely a little trickier in ultras to you feel good now but you know you have so much time to go so you can't burn too much but it's usually by pace and how my body is feeling and i'll also check in on my heart rate briefly but um in the moment like in a race in a workout i try not to obsess over heart rate because i know that you know the sensors i have are imperfect and if i know in kind of my deep soul what this effort feels like and if it's too hard i back off and so actually the second i hit a mile 20 i was like all right now we we're hitting a hillier rollier section now we're going to consciously back off the intensity and um yeah that next 10 miles actually felt really strong even though i was kind of moving backwards in place that was kind of still by design to like okay let's pull the effort back let's not burn ourselves too much and then unfortunately it just hit a big side uh, stomach stitch and the rest of the race went reeling from there but um i'd say through about halfway through the race i was still in a comfortable position right where i wanted to be did you have a particular nutrition strategy going into the race and did you stick to it uh, yes i did have a kind of laid out plan i like to before every race i do kind of i a like to study historical splits on kind of usually where the leaders of previous races or or people that through experience i know have run the race intelligently um try to base off of how they paced it and then from there i know the amount of like calories carbs and sodium i like to consume per hour uh from there and kind of try to build backwards from it so i stuck to my nutrition plan almost to a t i inevitably when my stomach does go haywire which usually deep in a race i i know that the plan i've set out will rarely um fully work out and i think that's one thing i'm trying to work on in races in the future is try to really hone in on a plan that my stomach will agree with the entire time um but i always bring backups um, of everything i have and or different little treats that i do just to like if your stomach really doesn't feel bad it really feels bad i know that at least these things will work so for me this race that was actually um dr pepper uh was kind of something i switched out on i know that um kind of the high sodium drink mixes that i use are really great and usually my stomach likes them but it only likes them for about five hours six hours and then anything from there it can't stomach the thought of another one so i think having backup things in place um 
I think the one the one strategy I've done with every race is have loads of salt pills lined up because that no matter what my nutrition goes to, um, I know that I'm a pretty high sodium burner. So having ample amounts of uh, salt handy. Have you had your sodium sweat test uh, done? Not officially. I've done some online tests and I think I, I know some people that uh, have access to sodium salt tests. And it's very much something I'm looking to do in the near future. But. I think that could be, uh, could be a bit of a game changer. I used to struggle on gels after like probably seven, eight hours, but it starts to turn around six, seven hours. Mm -hmm. And I, I did the, the sweat test uh, actually during UTMB week and mm -hmm. find that I lose some, nearly like 1400 milligrams of sodium. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so I, I'm like a moderately to, to high um, uh, loser of sodium. And once mm -hmm. I uh, upped the amount that I was taking, I was able to take gels right into the 20, 30 hours. So um, I didn't, I never once thought the stomach was starting to bloat and starting to feel uncomfortable and the naked belt was starting to get tight and all this type of stuff. Yeah. And it was purely because it was like this imbalance. It was just getting more and more out of sync as the hours uh, ticked by. So that could be, that could be a cool one um, for you oh. to, to, un to unlock. Is there a particular um, uh, uh, brand of nutrition that you use? I like to uh, mix it up. Usually um, I've noticed a, um, I like a diversity of amount of gels. I uh, have recently started to really enjoy Never Second. I've kind of joined their ambassador program, but um, yeah, in general with nutrition, I like to switch it up as much as I can. And um, I think maybe one thing I'm going to try with in the future is really honing in on one type of substance and maybe not flood my stomach with a million things, but all to be iterated. And I think one thing I really enjoy about every race is it's a new opportunity to try out some different strategies. And, you know, I think it's for me really important that uh, after every race to kind of enjoy and appreciate, even if it doesn't go perfectly to plan, uh, celebrate the the wins you did have. And above all else, if you cross the finish line, you know, if you don't, I, I am fortunate to have still yet to DNF a race, but I know inevitably there comes a moment in every career where you kind of have to, but I think every race has a, a moment to celebrate and enjoy, but Every race, even one that seemingly goes perfectly, still has things you could approve upon. So I think the fun part is celebrating the wins and then, all right, we did X, Y, Z, but how can we do X, Y, Z better the next time? And so I think it's a great mindset. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the uh, with the DNF. It's it's just part of the sport. Nobody goes through life with 100 percent success rate at any one thing. Oh. And uh, every everything that we do is, you know, we're just learning along the way. So whenever uh the race got tough after the stomach issues what was that second half of the race like was it were the muscles going was, were the quads burning how how did that feel yeah the really the whole body started to go south um the second half of the race when things started to get really get tough i'd say really for me probably hours five six and seven of the race um is a combination of things i'd say physically uh pretty much every inch of my legs outside of maybe the quads really just started to have massive cramps to the point of kind of needing to walk uh not necessarily long stretches but a lot of different times or to take two three seconds to reset um the uh stomach just didn't feel great and i think um with as with any kind of race around 100 kilometers or so inevitably i uh, the stomach pains i mentally it's really hard to tell is this stomach pain because i'm not eating or is it because i've eaten too much and inevitably i always found that it's usually because you haven't been eating enough so it's almost always a best to go for it um, i think there's a few times where i had to stop and like cough and really deeply breathe so i didn't vomit um because I, I know that vomiting is just going to lose everything you just put into your stomach uh, recently. Uh, but I'd say mentally, it was the, hard, the hardest part was mentally just trying to keep finding a reason to push, keep finding a reason to go for it. Um, I was fortunate to have one of my good friends, Elon, who was pacing me the whole way. Because this year, the way Black Canyon shaped up, um, you were allowed a pacer from roughly halfway through the race on. So I think having an external voice pushing me helped me keep going. But um, I knew I knew that the A goal was probably at the range. I it kept a lofty goal of still finishing place-wise um, highly throughout the whole time. But mentally, I knew I wasn't going to quit and I knew I wasn't going to stop. It's just how 
are we going to walk this in? Are we going to push? And um, I was still running the whole time, but the miles got a lot slower. And then I think it was the whole time for me, I was like, just keep going, keep going. It's going to turn around. It's going to turn around. And I think not losing that faith and what turnaround means is kind of irrelevant of place or time. It's just like, can you put forth an effort that you feel is comfortable and reflective of how you feel? And it took a lot longer than I wanted to, but I think at about mile 48, something just clicked. Um, and honestly, I, from having led the race through the, about the first 20 miles to at that point, then just kind of constantly getting passed by people definitely mentally wearing on me. I think at that point, at one point I was down to about 26th place and it was just like, ah, like, is this, are we just going to sulk it in? Are we just going to like let people pass me the whole way and just finish for the sake of finishing? And the whole time I was like, no, I'm going to push. I'm a competitor. I honestly don't really care about place. It's just about passing and going for it. And we, the second I passed one person at about mile 49, it, the, from that point on, I wasn't passed again. It was only passing people. And so I was able to claw my way back to about 19th place. So I was able to pass about seven people in that last 12 miles. And for me, the, the one part I found funny was even though I was about 15 minutes slower than my time last year from Table Mesa, which is the last large aid station to the finish about a 12 and a half mile stretch. I still ran about a minute faster than I did last year. So um, we had a pretty big blow up, but we were still able to close uh, even faster than I did when I ran the entire course faster. So uh, I find a lot of takeaways from that. And I know that I think for me in future races, it's really honing in on how can we avoid a big blow up in the middle because I know I feel comfortable running the beginning of the race strong. I think my one big takeaway from this race is maybe we can back off at the beginning and race from the back a little more. I, I know I have a lot of good friends who race really intelligently. And actually, one of my good friends is uh, Chris Myers, the guy who ended up getting third place and got a golden ticket to Western States. And he was he didn't pass me until about uh, mile 31 of the race. So um, I think learning how can we really focus on finishing hard, because I know that if I am in a good place physically and mentally the whole race that kind of we can pass anyone who's out there um, there's really no one that scares me to death about not beating them i think not not putting the competition on a pedestal is probably the most important thing you can do to really unlocking yourself um, to the best of your potential no i think that i think that sounds really really smart so you're coming off uh, another learning experience going into your first year as a sponsored athlete, you've got CCC in August. What have we got leading up to uh, August in terms of training races and on, you know, what's, what's your thinking there? Oh yeah. So the, and the big mantra for me this year is one race at a time. I uh, have a nice schedule laid out for myself, but kind of taking each race as they go. Um, I have, uh, fortunately we're about 10 days after black Canyon and my legs feel really good. I've been back to running the last few days. I was actually able to bike most days last week and then feel good enough to go skiing. So the physically and mentally i'm in a good place i'm not trying to overdo it and jump back in too strong um but i have not given up the golden ticket chase to western states i am currently signed up for the canyons 100 kilometer race at the end of april and um trying to, kind of in that mental state of very excited but still trying to like not think about it too much i think it's very important for me to take a big mental reset after every race and not not burn myself out um, and not obsess over things but i'm really excited to have another opportunity to kind of literally improve upon the lessons I just learned so soon. Um, and, you know, for me, Canyons is um, much closer to home for me. It's about uh, from the finish line is only about a two hour drive from my house. So it's a lot easier for me to get out on course and kind of really scope things out. Um, so we have Canyons is the next big A race in mind. Uh, the obvious goal behind a golden ticket race is to try to line up uh, in Palisades Tahoe at the end of June for Western States. But I think I'm realistic about having a lot of other very talented people chasing that same goal and only two tickets this time around. So we're going to see what the summer has in mind when we get there, but uh, above all else, happy to go out to CCC again and um, happy to be running on trails the whole time. I suppose you've got plenty of time after Canyons to reset and come back with another another good block. Will you go to Europe early? Still figuring that out now. I think based on my work schedule, um, it's unlikely I can go out for a sustained amount of time, but um hoping to get out there at least a little earlier than I did last year. And I, above all else, I think now that I know 
what the entire course looks like. Um, I can maybe pick the areas around myself that have the best kind of training stimulus. And I am fortunate enough to, I don't really, I can't really match the altitude. Not that um, Chamonix or the Alps have the same altitude as a place like Hard Rock or Colorado, but it is inevitably a variable that I'd say last year was something I didn't work on a lot, but the Bay Area still has plenty of extremely steep mountainous trails that um, I think served me really well last year. So I think now knowing the exact um, profiles I'm up against um, can really hone in on a slightly better trading block. And I think, yeah, every time just iterating a little more and finding um, a little bit more that you can do. I think I've done a great job of doing 90 something percent of the work so far. But now the fun part is iterating on that final five, six, seven, eight, ten percent and really achieving every last drop you can out of yourself. Yeah, that's gonna be cool to follow. And of course, this this year you will save a bit of money going to Chamonix because no doubt you'll be in the in, in the Norda house. Yes. Hopefully we have a we've been talking about the house. I know we have a little less athletes running it this year just due to various schedule reasons and whatnot, but um, we'll still have a good house and yeah, anytime anytime I can spend a week in Chamonix. Um, especially with uh, people as lovely as the Norda fam. It's uh, only setting myself up for success. All right, let, let's wrap things up. I just want to ask you a couple of uh, kind of shorter, quick fire questions, coached or not. I always joke that uh, you're looking at my coach. I am self-coached. I am fortunate to have a lot of mentors that I bounce training ideas off of, but uh, having spent eight years uh, training in high school and college, I felt like I did a really good job of how to build a training plan, and now it's... Um, really just catering each training plan to the race, but uh, yeah, self-coached. Personally, I find that whenever I'm not working under a coach, that whenever I go out for a, a three by 15 minutes, I might do a three by 12 minutes or a, a two by 15 minutes and a one by 10, or, you know, I, I, I find it easy to modify it on the fly and like, I shouldn't, but uh, I like that accountability. Are you strict with yourself? Uh, strict enough. I think one thing I like about being self-coached and kind of why I maintained self-coaching, even though I've consciously been trying to elevate my game the last few years, um, is the flexibility, the flexibility allows while maintaining accountability. I think every training plan has to bend to just life. And for me being a full-time engineer, um, as well as having kind of various other training goals, I think I can put a very lofty training plan in mind, but in practice, you have to kind of know, be realistic about what you can achieve. And so I think uh, I am strict enough in the sense that, uh, for example, when doing marathon builds, I joke that I'm my own best torturer because I can conceive the like nastiest, cruelest workouts I can imagine. And I have no problem forcing myself to do it. So I think it's strict when I need to be, but uh, flexible when I need to be as well. How many workouts per week? Uh, it varies depending on the race I'm doing. I think I, I love to train for whatever the next A race is. Um, and workouts to me kind of vary in what they do. Uh, when I'm doing a more road-based um, training block, it's usually two very hard speed workouts a week. When I'm maybe doing more trail-oriented uh, work, I still like to do one speed workout a week. Even when I was building the CCC, I was still kind of keeping that aerobic engine going. But uh, the second workout of the week when I'm doing maybe longer trail races is more just kind of hard efforts on trails, less less focused on specific intervals or heart rate, and really more about just kind of picking terrain and saying, I'm going to push this as hard as I can. Um, and then far more importantly to me, it's like then following up a workout with proper recovery. Um, and inevitably when training for really long races, I really love to do roughly 50k long runs every week that my legs will let me do so i wouldn't say that's necessarily a workout but it's definitely a big <laughs> training stimulus and uh, i think what's really helped me set myself up for success in mountain ultras poles or hands on knees it varies uh i'd say for a race like ccc is still the only race i've used poles um and i will use poles again but for um most races i, I tend to not go poles i like to just you know, keep my running form. And uh, I, I ideally like to be as kind of lean and minimalist as possible. I actually wear a belt for almost every race I do. I rarely wear a pack. So um, yeah, I'd say more times than not, um, just hands on these. So American. Yeah. Guilty of charge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt. Lovely. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you in Chamonix. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. 
Thanks for making it to the end of the show. We hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the YouTube if you haven't already. We would love you to like it. We would love you to share it with a friend. If you do share it, please tag us on social media and we will send you a bag of gels. Anyway, we'll catch you in the next show. Peace. Oh, 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 o